You are listening to The Call In, a series of conversations recorded by Array with filmmakers of color and women of all kinds to discuss feature, narrative, and documentary work. This conversation with Array releasing filmmakers Chantrell P. Lewis, director of In Our Mother's Gardens, and Ansley Gardner and Briar Grace Smith, the co directors of Cousins, was recorded on August 24th, 2021. Both films are now streaming on Netflix. Hi, you two. It's Chantrell. I'm so excited about this conversation and to be here with you all um, for a raise call in Ainsley and Briar. How are you this morning? Yeah. Hey, Chantrell. Good. We're so excited too. So what time is it there? Because you all are in New Zealand right now, right? Or Yeah, yeah it's um, 8.07 8 a.m. in the morning. Coffee time. Y'all mm. are better than me because I don't know if I could be talking to anybody with a smile on my face, coffee or not, <laughs> at 8 o'clock in the morning. So thank y'all for joining us or joining me to be in this conversation. I've been like anxiously awaiting um, to have this convo with you. I remember it was only a few months ago that I had my own uh, call in. And so to be on the other side uh, is into welcoming another uh, set of filmmakers and into the Array family is like pretty exciting. And your film, can I start off by like congratulating you all? It's incredible. I loved it. Um, Thank you. I shouldn't have watched it when I was as emo as I was because there <laughs> were so many scenes that, um, that uh, had me in my feelings. Um, I was inspired by the film. I, there were so many aspects of the storytelling that resonated with me. Um, I think the acting was superb. Clearly the directing was superb. Um, so I have, there's just like so many questions that I have for you all. So I hope y'all are ready. I hope that coffee, I don't know if you like it strong and black or, <laughs> you know, with sugar, like I like <laughs> mine, but I hope y'all are ready for, you know, all of the questions that I have, because I'm just like, so excited. Shintro, can I just say on behalf of Briar and I as well, congratulations on your beautiful film. So um, back at you with all of that. It was beautiful to watch. And also, I guess... This, the same with cousins is to feel like such a, a resonance for your your um, stories and our stories and the similarities and the stuff that's going on. So yeah, congratulations to you too. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. And it, it feels great, um, honestly, to be uh, telling stories right now and in good company, you know, um, and to be able to see other films like for like in our mother's gardens to be released alongside a film like cousins that's so important and you know black stories are um oftentimes monolithic so i can only imagine indigenous stories from new zealand you know like how many how often uh are, are you know indigenous filmmakers you know across the globe able to tell stories you know not just being a person of color but like indigenous so you add that extra layer on top of that, um, it's it's a it's a huge feat, and also to release it during a pandemic, <laughs> a global plant pandemic. So that was that's a huge feat. I wanted to start you know start out by congratulating you again. Um, the film recently you know released on uh, Netflix and in theaters in Hawaii um, in July, which is major um, for it to also to be released in theaters. And you know it's been reviewed by the New York Times, you know all the heavy hitters, you know New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Journal. Shondaland, Sundance Institute. Um, so how, how has it felt? Like you work on something and then you release it. Like how does it, like how does it feel just even having it out in the world? Well, I mean, that's weird, isn't it? Because I feel like Briar and I are parents and Cousins is now sort of like a teenager who's left home. <laughs> um, because we had a release here in May, which for us is always the kind of most, um, the most significant one is right. how your own your, your own people respond to the stories. So, um, the, to then um, be able to release it, we knew we, we've been part of a global indigenous filmmaking community for many many years, and so we knew that it was a story that would resonate um, around the world and other communities. Uh, and so we were just really looking forward to being able to to share it with those communities um, 
and Array gave us the opportunity to do that. So it was really exciting. It's so sad that we haven't been able to be there. We were able to go to Australia and share it with Aboriginal communities, which was amazing. And also a lot of expat, expat um, Pat New Zealanders, New Zealand Māori live in Australia. So we got to share it in that shared space, which is so important with storytelling and filmmaking. So it's a little bit bittersweet because there are so many um, of our friends and family and communities around the world who we would have loved to have been there uh, with, but the response has been fantastic. Yeah. What's been amazing, I think for us both, is um, we're used to uh, releasing films in our own country, but it's very rare that we can break through that. And thanks to Array, it's been, of course, released um, in the US and via Netflix. And the response, um, I just get a tingle every time, you know, we're getting the responses from America now, and that's completely different. That's quite a new thing for me. Which is something I'm always mindful of. I have a lot of, I do a lot of work outside of the US in the diaspora. And so I'm always conscious of my friends who are not coming from Black America, but who are Black and in Europe or Black mm. in other parts of the globe. And so it's like the American, you know, like machine is pretty dominant. Um, mm. So it is while it is also frustrating for people outside of the States, but when you can have your stories amplified, you know, like by the machine that is like, you know, mass media in the States and, you know, a, a global streaming service like Netflix, that's huge, you know, and, mm -hmm. and telling a story that otherwise, like, you know, a black woman from New Orleans, I might not, you know, uh, uh, come across or my, my neighbors in Philadelphia, in East Germantown, Philadelphia. And so I think um, a Ray, is uh, I'm grateful for Array, you know, just even for amplifying my, my you know, little story that is universal. And, that, and that's the thing, I think that you, when you're a filmmaker um, of color, then it's almost like there's so much pressure and so much weight to like get your story right because so many other people don't have the chances, particularly for their stories to get told on a much, you know, wider level. And so there's mm -hmm. like a lot of pressure there to like get it right and to represent well, cause you're not only telling your story, but you're telling the story of, you know, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands or however many, you know, other people who are not able to, uh, to, um, have their voices heard in that way on a, such a large scale. And so I think um, it, it was, I think that was one of the beautiful things as I'm sitting there and both resonating, but also learning, you know, like, wow, like that community is going through that, you know, in the similar ways that it also happens in our community and like how, how many other people have been able to relate as well, um, you know, and by watching your film. Um, and, and, you know, and being able to connect in such a personal, intimate way. Yeah, and I think that, I think that um, Black voices, voices of colour, Indigenous voices, so many of our historical experiences are so similar. You know, we share a lot of trauma and we also have these um, kind of narratives of the, the kind of strength and power of our, our women and our mothers. And I think that it is, it's about sharing film, but I think also one of the important things is that this is the way that we get to connect with each other at a personal level. And I think that we are so much more powerful, the bigger our collective grows, this collective of filmmakers who are supporting each other and, you know, finding spaces for our voices to be heard and seen and that sort of thing. So it's that other layer of our films being uh, seen and heard, but also that opportunity for us to connect with one another and kind of be to be just become globally, you know, more and more powerful, ready for takeover. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, while watching, so first, I just want to tell you some of my favorite, like, aspects of the film. I thought the cinematography, just from the trailers alone, like, when Array first put out the visuals, I was like, oh, my God, it's breathtaking. There was, like, a whimsical aspect of it um, that also felt, um, like, otherworldly in a sense. You know, it's like I was going to be transported somewhere else. And there was, like, a softness, even though it was a hard story, there was a softness, um, which I think it's probably with you all's 
direction and vision and collaboration, I'm assuming with a, a, a team of creatives that you were able to pull it together, but that was just like um, a softness that was there that even reminded me of myself and like, you know, telling the stories of black women, there's lots of trauma, my, even my own personal narrative as a survivor, there's trauma there. And it's like, how do I make this not a, another like trauma porn? How do I avoid, how am I to, able to be honest but I can avoid trauma porn and re, not only just, because we have the responsibility to educate others, right? Mm -hmm. um, to make our voices heard. But then we're also being responsible for handling with care our stories and the stories of our people. And it's how do we do that without re-traumatizing ourselves every time we put our stories on film, you know? And for people to consume it in a in a large way, and so that was one of the things that I I think really touched me. I also was really um, I mean immediately like the characters like Missy. I was Missy, mm -hmm. um, definitely growing up like the spunky one that was always at my grandmother's house. And I remember I had other cousins who were like I called them white socialized because they weren't spending too much ass time with our family. And it's like, they will come and they will call and it's like, oh, is grandmother Gladys there? And it's like cold switching voice. And I'm like, who y'all talking about grandma? Hold on, let me get her, right? And so, you know, I was able to relate to that. And also um, I haven't publicly spoken about this, but I had a little cousin whose mom was married to one of my uncles. Um, and it was like a, you know, not a great marriage and she left took my little cousin when he was a year old and moved away to the Midwest and he was missing for, you know, his entire life. And he was my dad's godson. And we ended up finding him by, uh, he ran track and my dad saw an article and was like, I think this is, you know, your cousin. And so I emailed him and through that process, we were able to reconnect. So I, on a very personal level also, like in, you know, my relations with my own cousins, I, I, I have so many stories that I was able to like really personally relate to. And so um, I just had to share that with you. It was just like so many aspects that were, um, that, you know, jumped out at me. What, for you all, if you, for the audience and for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, which of course you adapted it from a book, but for people who have not read the book, people who haven't seen the film yet, if you had to like give them a teaser, like how would you describe cousins? It's the story of uh, three cousins and the one of the cousins, Mata, is stolen. So it's three girl cousins and she's taken away and made a ward of the state and then disappears from their lives. And it's really the story um, over, over the, I guess, the span of about 50 years um, of the implications that her disappearance has on their family and on their destiny until they are able to bring her back into the fold. I love that. Definitely the references to indigenous spirituality, um, which I think in both of our films, you know, we touched on it while it wasn't like the direct, you know, underlying, well, so for yeah. me, at least it was an the underlying theme in mind. And I thought that was important. How important was it for you all to uh, discuss indigenous spirituality and how, like in terms of a theme, um, you know, how essential was that for you all? How important was that? Yeah, I think the thing about for us with spirituality, it wasn't even so much that it's important to discuss. It's just that for us, it's that we live alongside it. It's not other. It's not other. Um, and and I loved that about some of the ways in which the women that you interviewed talked about spirituality as well. It's just I'm just cooking up some food for the for the ancestors as if you know why not. Um, and that's it for us. Why not? This is how it is for us every day. Um, we live our lives with our ancestors beside us. And that's the way we sort of see time as well. There's not a kind of linear structure to it. So those things were really important in the storytelling, actually, more about the nature of time. Um, and yes, there was early discussion, I think, about the ways in which we didn't want spirituality to feel like this otherworldly sort of thing like ghosts or um you know uh something unusual so yeah we, we had a lot of discussions about the the ways in which we would try and make the film feel very present no matter what time we were in it should sort of feel quite 
present and now all of the time. Um, Ray, who was our cinematographer, he uh, just turned 30 before that. That was his first feature film. Oh, wow. he, yeah, but he's Māori and he was raised as a first language speaker and we have um, schools called Kura Kaupapa, which are um, Māori language schools that go all the way through to um, high school. So he had his whole school life in te reo Māori, Māori language, which means he just has a very um, deep and easy connection to culture because he has the, the key which for many of us is language and many of us don't have it so I think that was it his he just had a very easy um way of capturing the world with a very uniquely and specifically Maori lens without even trying um, and also I think that sort of sense of whimsy um, comes from comes from Briar's writing of the script, but also from the book itself. It's whimsical. It's it's like poetry or it's like painting. It's sort of magical, anyway. And so yeah, there's, there was a lot of that. Um, and yeah, so Briar, did you have any thoughts about spirituality? I know we talked about it a lot. No, but I know that um, Chantrell brought up the um, sort of magical, which is the same um, nature of the way the story, the visual storytelling, and we talked a lot about. Um, seeing the story through a child's eyes and I think because we looked at uh, shooting it that way and we walked into it that way um, it took away su some of the hard edges that maybe if it was a more adult story that 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 it would have come across in a in a, in a harder way. Oh yeah and that's what I was going to say about Ray as well is that it's I think that thing you're talking about with being able to tell a story of trauma without it being traumatizing is that so often the stories that are told about us are not told by us and actually when we tell these stories when we're looking at these damaged people we're looking at them with love all we see is strength and resilience and beauty and I love in your documentary how um just the the glowing way in which all of the interview subjects talk about their mothers and their grandmothers even as they describe quite difficult things but what's the most kind of um overwhelming is is the sense of love and I think that's what happens in indigenous storytelling is that when we we love our characters every one of them yes and and it's resonant because it's not an either or it's an and you know mm. Um, and so, like, you know, there might be trauma, and it might be oppression, it might be like violence, and there's also beauty, there's depth, there's love, there's magic, there's power, and there's agency, um, there, there's so many, there's lineage, you know, um, and, and that was very apparent. Um, to that point, I was very curious as like an avid reader, um, how because I haven't had the book read you know read the book but definitely it's um it's added to my list now um but how challenging was it um I have two separate questions how challenging was it to adapt a book that was well received um have you heard any response from any like you know true fans of the book like in terms of oh my god this was spot on or this is a beautiful adaptation or oh remember that one part you know you should have done it like this so I'm curious about that because that's a huge, you know, um, task when people are adapting books. And the other question I have is also for Briar is like co-directing, you know, and 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 also acting in the film. And I didn't have to act; I just had to talk, which is for me mm -hmm. easy. I have zero problems with being on the mic. Um, I used to rap when I was I was a little hip hop. <laughs> And, and growing up so I don't have those you know but so I, I can imagine both co-directing and acting and another, one of my best friends Numa Perrier whose film was also released by Array last year Jezebel she also directed the film was telling a personal story of her her own life and she starred in the film as well so those are the two questions like adapting the book um for the screen and then also in a response to that and then also um you know, both co-directing and, 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 you know, starring in the film. So there's a long story around the, um, so I'll try and make it shorter, around the adaptation because Mira Tamita, who's um, the subject of another RA film, um, How Mum Decolonized the Screen, um, is, is a, one of our most um, 
our most revered Māori filmmakers and in fact the only Māori woman who direct, directed and wrote a feature film over a space. There was a 30 year gap between her film and the next feature that that wow. came along. So we we've we've had this missing from our lives and from our culture for so for so long. So she had tried for about 20 years with the author Patricia Grace to adapt the story. And um, due to the way things were at that time, um, it never happened. It wasn't um, uh, wasn't thought that a story about um, essentially Maori woman would do well. Mm. Um, also, the funders thought the protagonist was too passive, um, that there wasn't enough drama, et cetera, et cetera, in the story. So it never, it never came to light. But the novelist was my um, mother-in-law. Um, I've separated from her son. Okay. <laughs> but so over that time, I sort of sat with her and um, Merita, listening to some of the problems they had in the adaptation. So I never read their scripts. But what, one thing I did understand that the book is very, very epic. There are many more characters and stories than there are in the film. Um, so the first thing I did, I think I read the book three times and I was quite hard mm. on my interpretation. So the first thing I did was um, I was quite ruthless in taking out um, characters and events that weren't adding to kind of a narrative spine as such. Mm -hmm. and truncating things and bringing them together so I had kind of a already had a heads up so it was a a bit of an easier journey for me and also there was this like trickle down effect it wasn't a hard screenplay to write okay it's been the easiest one I've I've tackled so that was good but the response so I sort of felt like I understood it enough also to kind of be that I could hold on to the spirit of it and be a bit free with it. And I think that's important. Um, we've had actually no one, people really ever comment on um, the how they feel the book versus versus the screenplay. So we haven't had much feedback, have we, Angs? It, it just makes me laugh because the whole way through, Briar and I are like, you know, you try and stay off social media and you're always afraid people are gonna say it's crap. But, you know, we had just such overwhelmingly positive responses I kept saying to Brian man Brian we haven't had any negative right. feedback and then when it went to Australia I did see one comment was um uh, I didn't enjoy it that much the book was way better and somebody <laughs> else said yeah the book's way better and I sort of felt relieved I was like oh phew, finally <laughs> finally but, no because, and I think because I think that's right you captured the spirit of the novel and we worked closely with Patricia um Patricia and Briar are still dear dear friends and you know and so she fed into it and you know I think the thing with um with films or stories that have a long history within themselves is they're just doing their own thing we're just along for the ride they're yeah. doing they already know where they're going and um and I think you know it's easy for me to romanticize how easy the writing was because I wasn't doing it but it did, as Brian said it did feel like quite a um a smooth process the whole way through and I think that's because Briar and I always acknowledged that ours were just uh, two of the pairs of hands that were ushering this film where it needed to go um, and we had such um, kind of support from those that had gone before us um, spiritually and practically and you know so it I think when you read the book and I had read it many many years before um, there it's it is like poetry and it's so dense with imagery that there are things that you remember. The thing I always remembered was the marble, you know, and I think that Briar captured the, the pieces um, that for most readers are the things that would have stuck in their mind the most. So in that mm -hmm. way, I think it would have been really satisfying for most of the book readers. Um and then Yes, Brian. I just was going to say too that um, what was really important about the adaptation is that the book is written, um, it's a kind of a, we call it a spiralic, it's a new word, storytelling, it's a kind of, it's written like a, a spiral, sort of community storytelling, and um, the way that Māori, when um, we're 
I guess when we're in our meeting houses, mm -hmm. when we're having debates or community gatherings and people stand up to speak, to make a point, they um, often don't go forward in time. They, 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 they speak about the point they want to make. They stand in the present, but to make the, their point heard, they're always referring to the past. Mm. And so it's like a gathering of things, you mm. know, and in the end, you, you get it. And um, the book of Cousins is told in the same way. It leaps around from past to present to further back. And um, so it was really important for us um, to hold on to that particular way of telling a story. And many, several times we had feedback um, from people to make the story linear because yeah. they weren't because they weren't used to that way of storytelling. Is your eccentric? Yeah. So you so you're eccentric, and it's what's so interesting. It's one of the things we talk about a lot is just the these rules of storytelling that we've inherited from Hollywood and from Greek Roman kind of storytelling and that sort of thing. And it's like. Briar, the, uh, sorry, Patricia, the novelist described in our meeting houses where we gather to, to speak, mm -hmm. she describes, and it's got a, a ceiling like this, and she describes how the voices collect in the ceiling, and, um, and that's sort of the spirit of the novel and of the film, it's a collection of moments, a collection of voices, and we're so interested in just finding new slash old ways of storytelling that that actually do capture us and so cousins becomes a film that you feel it doesn't it's not about intellectual understanding or it's just about the the feels that we get when we gather in our meeting houses with all of those collected voices of our ancestors that's how that's how storytelling should make you feel and and I think that for people again when when in african uh specifically in uh in a Khan culture from ghana there's a symbol and a concept called sankofa which means to go back and fetch it so it's that same idea and so in the sankofa wow. bird you see the symbol it's like a bird with its beak turned back towards its tail um and so it's like yeah. that same circular concept and mama coco uh from my film <laughs> who yeah everyone's wow. favorite uh <laughs> And I actually thought, I was like, people are gonna think this is too much. Like it's so, cause I had so much footage because she's definitely a circular storyteller. Like she'll mm -hmm. go around the world and then come back. I do, I go around the world and I always don't remember to come back. <laughs> <laughs> she does that so eloquently though. Um, but uh, that circular storytelling and, um, and I remember being like, you know, because that was a newer edition. I, I filmed her during COVID and I had like almost no budget at this time. It was like me, one camera guy, one sound guy, and um, one of my producers, Joshua. And I was like, how are we going to put, there was so much stuff here. And I was like, people are going to complain it's too long and they're going to get bored. And that was the one section that people were like, we want Mama Coco. We want to see more of her. We want to hear more of her. So uh, that circular um, aspect of storytelling is very um, familiar even. So I, um, I am a Yoruba priest, the Yoruba people, one of the largest groups in Nigeria and their spirituality survived in Cuba, Brazil and other parts of the diaspora. And so, um, and, and, and oftentimes when, you know, the way we do ceremonies and it's also like a very circular, everything is done, you know, in the circle. Um, mm -hmm. And so that felt very, very familiar. And now in terms of co-directing acting, you know, is that was something that came with ease? Was it challenging? Um, it, was, it was challenging. The story behind that too is I was a slightly reluctant actor. So Nancy Brunning, been, <laughs> Nancy Brunning, who was a stunning actor, one of our best had been cast in the role of older Makareta and um, she became, became very ill. Mm. And um, and that it wasn't getting any better. And we were two weeks before shoot, and um, we all decided that it was best that she um, that we all let go of the idea of her taking that role. And so um, I ended up um, putting my hand up. Well, no, not really. I said, <laughs> I said, oh gosh, I may as well audition. I used to act for the theatre. And okay. then I had a tap on the shoulder and our casting director was there with the camera. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. 
I tell this story differently a lot, but I think I had to audition, to audition two or three times until I did get the role. <laughs> but, when, Briar, when Briar describes that process of auditioning, I'm like, what? I don't remember making you audition four, four or five four times, five. but um, <laughs> apparently I did. But what it was is because we had spent so long as writer-producer and then we decided to co-direct and then we had built this relationship of co-directing and we, we worked really hard to, to um, work on how we would collaborate in a really Māori-centric kind of a way. And then when Briar became the front runner for this role, I think I panicked about, well, how it changed the dynamic. Right. But, dynamic. She, but yeah. absolutely, she was the best for the role. Yes. I loved you. Um, I loved your your role um, and how you carried that part out. Again, myself, I had no intentions on being in the film. <laughs> you know, I, I told my story just because I just didn't feel like we needed to hear my voice as director and me telling my story. And I was like, there are so many other people. Why me add to that? Um, but there was something, and in, in definitely even with the. I found that footage of my grandmother during, uh, I'm about to say Katrina, thinking about another tr trauma and that Hurricane Katrina anniversary is coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, um, oh, this weekend. So I'm like, I meant the pandemic, but I found this, uh, all of this footage that I didn't even know existed of my grandmother um, and me, you know, like all of the, like this video footage that I had been recording when I was in high school and college. And I'm like, oh my God, it was like hearing my grandmother's voice for the, first time and uh, she passed away in 2007. So I just feel like it was meant, you know, because it was all of that beat and I didn't have all this extra B-roll. And so it was, it was all of these gaps were able to be filled. And so I was just, I said she helped to co-direct Beyond the Grave. Like it was like me and my grandmother. So um, speaking of challenges, like what challenges did you to face during production, you know, besides this actor who you, you know, this actress who you, had was ideal for the role and then not being able to play were there any other you know significant challenges one of the things that happened when briar became the obvious choice to replace nan um was that the two adult the younger adult actors that we had who were playing missy and makareta we did the casting kind of energetically not really based on how they looked but just how they felt and suddenly those two actors didn't quite match the adult actors anymore so a week out from filming we had to swap them um and so that was challenging for them because they had absolutely um fallen in love with their own characters and then they had to swap costumes which was hilarious because one of them is glamorously dressed and one of them is dressed in you know huckery trousers with a rope belt so um so they had to swap. That was that was an emotional challenge, but it ended up being a really, really good choice. I feel like some of our early challenges were just working out how to work together. You know, we talked about, um, I've produced for co-directors and often it becomes about who's the loudest person in the room. Mm. Um, and Briar and I are so different Um in our experiences, in our upbringings, in our personalities, that we had to work really hard on how we would become true collaborators. So it was always, we always had to come to agreement um, and we wouldn't go, we wouldn't go any further until we did. And I, I thought that was also one of the things I'm most proud of as well because you know as creative people we all have our own egos and our own sensibilities that you want to protect and but I think it's part of what I was saying about trying to unpick the Hollywood process and and try and rediscover our own natural process so that true collaboration was an early challenge but once we kind of worked it out it, it was one of the best things I think about the the shoot yeah I'd, I would um, support Ainsley in that, that the co collaboration actually strengthened um, the filmmaking and the process rather than diluted it mm -hmm. you know and it's that it is that thing of leaving your ego at the door and coming to each other with an idea and either realizing that the other one has a stronger idea because you're sharing a vision or putting things together and creating something um, something a little bit new but um, that was definitely one of the things I'm most proud of too.
Were there any other challenges, Briar? I always get stuck at this because I, again, romanticise it all so much. I'm like, Cause yeah, I think sailing. I think the challenges are the things that um, you kind of they weren't necessarily bad things. So uh, there's a there's a betrothal scene. We call it a tomo, where um, uh, and w which was a, a tradition and still in some ways is a tradition of ours. Um, that for that 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 for us was kind of a ch challenge because we haven't had that experience in our life. So we didn't know how yeah. it looked, what the process was. And with the, the tribal group we worked with, the iwi, um, they, had, um, they didn't have really a strong recollection either, mm. but in their lives it existed, but it was this thing that no one had a, a, a really firm idea of. And so we um, worked together with, with the Ngati Pikiao, the iwi, to create our own our own version of it, and that, that again was a lovely collaboration, and we came up with something that we were we were pleased with. That's great. And, yeah, I think working with the kids was always really tiring, but I, one of the things I found with the kids is not so much the kids; it's the adults. Adults are so impatient, <laughs> yeah. uh, myself included. Being a mother, I can recognise that, but. But it was, I, I, there was one day I left set <laughs> and it was sort of, we tried to flood our crew with women and with Māori women and with Māori men, mm -hmm. but there was still a, um, such a, there's such a powerful masculinity in the film industry in its processes and in its kind of sensibility that's so hard to, to, to completely um, dismantle in one go, but I did find that that was often overpowering and particularly when working with the kids, the way some of the adult men would behave just wore me down quite a bit. And I did have to leave set one day, like a, like a little diva, like, Briar, I have to go. And that was the great thing about having two directors as well, because Briar just stepped in and, um, and took over while I went and had a little, you know, tanty. <laughs> They're mildly, I'm sure. Um, and trust me, I mean, I was doing post during the pandemic while my husband, my two bonus kids were, they were virtually going to school. One was co in college, one was in high school. And so they heard lots of conversations that, you know, I had to apologize for later. <laughs> there were plenty of stressful moments and there was nowhere for me to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, it was all in the house. Um, in, in terms of distribution, how did you all choose Array? How did you come to Array? Um, yeah, like how, how did that, that bit of magic happen? We already had family in the Array family. So Cliff Curtis, who's a New Zealand actor, Chelsea Wynne Stanley, and New Zealand producer, and Heppy Mitter, um, who's a um, New Zealand filmmaker. His mother is Merita and he had um, directed this documentary about her that Briar had spoken of. And so that was already um, what part of the um, array. They were already part of the array family. So in a way it was, it felt like a natural fit. We reached out to them, our film commission in New Zealand, um, but also I think Cliff may have made contact with Tulane um, just to introduce us. And I don't know, just there was no option really once we had talked to Tulane. And I mean, I don't want to fangirl too much, but if Ava Duvernay wants you and her family, who are you to, <laughs> who are you to disagree in a way? Um, but I think it was that. I think, you know, for, we call it whakapapa, which is genealogy, or it sort of it talks about the layers of earth. Um, and so to already have a whakapapa to... Um, to array stuff like that's really important and also we knew that the communities that she would be able to reach were the communities we wanted to reach you know we weren't interested in in getting a mainstream I mean you know of course but mainstream eyes on the film as much as we were um in getting uh, communities of color indigenous communities to see our film so it was really again like everything with this film sort of 
it, everything had a simplicity and ease to it and that was the easiest choice to make eh, Brian? <laughs> mm -hmm. I think and that's the kiss me part or the serendipitous part where right? the synchronicity where you like you feel like it for me so many things were divine you know I mean like when I remember when Tulane reached out <laughs> in that conversation she was like Ava and I want the film I, I mean it was like and and but I had envisioned it I was like you know, I was like, this would be perfect for a raid, this film mm -hmm. about black women and our mothers. And, you know, so it all, the way things happened, it just felt divine. Like, cause even when I would reach roadblocks and challenges and, you know, they got rolled over or knocked down. I was just like, oh, this was supposed to happen. Like my ancestors and our collective ancestors wanted this to happen right now during this time period in this way. And so it felt, very um it just felt divine in a lot of ways for me um and I, I know that the ancestors had their hands deeply you know they were they were making so many things happen behind the scenes in front of the scenes um where it all felt right why do you think securing uh distribution for um independent films you know you know why is it so important you know do you think there are enough outlets for films like you know in our mother's gardens and cousins it's, it's tough because there's absolutely the audience. It's just how you cut through the noise. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's how you get those eyes on your film instead of on, you know, any other number of films that aren't necessarily expanding their view of the world or telling them something they don't know or reaffirming something they do know, you know. So I, I just think it speaks to that. Um, the, the more we can collectively start to create waves and that's why Array is so important actually is because that's the, that they're creating a groundswell of content that reaches people and those people say yes we want this content which then tells people this is the kind of stuff that that people want to see so it's so important I, I it's we're really lucky in New Zealand because for a long time um, a lot of our films have maybe for the last 30, 30 odd years New Zealand film has has had a value in the um, in the industry so we've got a little bit of that going on but it's relatively new as I think Briar said earlier for for Indigenous film um, by Indigenous filmmakers to have that same kind of um, yeah, that same kind of connection in the in the wider world. So I, I don't know. I just I I just kind of imagine in my mind. I just imagine this. I I see a sort of. I just watched Black Panther again. I feel like with this kind of Wakanda, um, the sense of us all just stepping forward together with our numbers gathering and you know and creating something powerful. Um, and in a way, I see what's happening here behind the camera with us as filmmakers and the films we're making, almost that being more important than who we're reaching, because we only need to reach one other person or 10 other people or 100 other people for that, for that kind of um, army of voices to get stronger. Mm. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and I went to school with Chad, so uh, <laughs> just oh. remember him going to see him at Ira Eldridge Theater. Ira Eldridge was a, 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 a really well-known um, 20th century uh, black thespian and theater maker. And so we would go see him at his plays at Ira Eldridge Theater. So, uh, and, you know, thinking about him and his transition as, you know, that anniversary um, is upon us as well. But um, lastly, I want to know, you know, what, and I'm sure people have asked you both this question, like, what would you tell, do you say, I have a friend named Maori, by the way. Mao Tsitong, Maori. So Mao, Maori. Yeah, yeah. Maori. Um, like, what would you say to a Maori, uh, a young, you know, storyteller and filmmaker um, who are, is listening to this conversation about what's possible? Just your voice is important. Mm. Your story is important. I feel like we all carry the weight of our our whole family, our whole tribe, our whole kind of people on our back. And, and as if, if we don't 
if we haven't got something massive to say, then what we have to say isn't important, but actually it's all of our accumulated small stories. Well, there are no small stories. So just find a way and what you have to say is important. Mm. And find mm. your community. I've, I, I know as um, a filmmaker, I think it's been really, um, it's been a real journey finding the right people to work with who will support and share the vision and elevate the work without trying to, to change it too yeah. much or turn it into something else. In uh, Yoruba culture, we say ashe when we like in strong agreement. <laughs> we say ashe uh, to something, and I, I I was telling my um bonus son who's back on uh, campus right now. I'm at college. He's at Morehouse, which is a historically black you know college and university here in the U.S. So of all these you know black men, and I'm like, if you leave without uh, developing a network of friends and people, then I feel like you failed. I feel mm. like you didn't do what we sent you there to do. Yes, getting a degree, but you have to find your tribe. You know, you have to find your village. And mm. there's no project that I've ever worked on as a creative that I've been able to pull off successfully without a village of people. Um, and in, in this case, it was my producers who came on board. It was my editor who I could have not done anything without. It was, you know, um, my, you know, the, the composers, you know, um, the animators, like, and then having, you know, Ava, Tulane, you know, Jeff, you know, this whole family at um, Array that, you know, came in and was like, we're going to like super elevate your voice as a filmmaker. We're going to super elevate this story um, mm -hmm. so that not only it, you know, it impacts lives um, and it also just gives you an opportunity to tell more stories. So like this won't be a singular story like heard from me or from the two of you. So mm -hmm. um, this was beautiful. Um, thank you for um, working so hard to get this, you know, this film adapted and onto the screen. Um, thank you both for your, your generosity um, and your care um, and the graceful way in which you um, shared a very, um, you know, both insular and universal tale um, of this, not only this like, you know, young woman and these older women um, and their lives, but their families and in the your greater um, community. So thank you for inviting us in. Um, that, that was definitely um, a wonderful experience. And I hope to see so much more from um, you know both of you. I hope we'll have many more conversations like this as we continue to do projects in the future. And um, just yeah, lastly, what, what are you working on now? Um, I'm working on a LGBTQI series called Rurangi, uh, working with a wonderful story table and we hope to shoot that next year. So um, I'm enjoying it very much. And again, um, here are a group of people or a group um, whose stories we don't hear enough and um, that, aren't, that aren't told, often told with an authentic voice. So it's, it's been awesome. Looking forward to shooting it. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> yeah, then... developing a lot. I'm in a development phase. I'm co-directing a web series comedy later this year, um, just to sharpen my directing tools a little more and then I'm really keen to I've got actually a lot of my projects are book adaptations so um, I'm not a writer per se but I'm inspired by by the worlds that novels create so just developing some stuff so watch the space yeah mm -hmm. and tell people where can they find you all where can you know clearly they can watch the film on Netflix uh, uh, in New Zealand and the States and the UK, um, so many different countries. Um, and where can they find you all? And how can they reach out? How can they learn more? How can they follow, um, you know, the um, the evolution of this teenage project? I'm the worst at social media, man. I can't even tell you how to follow me on anything. I'm such a shame. My teenage daughters are just going to have to get in there and do something for me. But I'm so, you know what? I'm so easy to contact. My contacts are all over, um, all over the internet. And I'm really happy for people to email me directly with thoughts or questions or, you know, um, and I'm sure somewhere, I'm sure I've got like an IMDB page or something. <laughs> Briar's um, way better at Instagram oh, than I am. <laughs> my Instagram handle is smithmith, S-M-I-T-H, 
M I T H. So they can contact me there. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your day because your day is just getting started. So thank you for spending this morning with me. Um, I this conversation filled me up um, as I I'm actually preparing for a ceremony, um, a drum, a sacred drumming ceremony at the end of the weekend. So it's just like that's the doorbells because I'm like packages are coming in and my community elders will be coming to Philadelphia to you know participate in this. So um, yeah, it, it just helped to give me a little bit more fuel. Um, mm -hmm. to keep at it. So thank you both. Um, I really appreciate you having it, taking this time and thanks to the array team um, for all of the work that you're doing for filmmakers like us. Um, we appreciate you. Mm, mm. Yeah, um, thank you, Shantrao. Um, he mahi nui, he mahi mahana, kia kui, kia koutou katoa te whanau array, um, ma ngā atua e manaki, kia koutou katoa, um, have a great day. That was just our language saying, may the gods protect you and have an awesome day. And thank you so much to you and to the Array family for taking care of us. I'd like to echo that too. Thank you, Chantrell and Array. Ngā mihi nui, ngā mihi aroha, kia koutou. Kia ora. Thank you both, Ashe.